Um, one of the most important topics that is currently debated is green hydrogen because of the high potential of uh, this uh, value chain. This is among the value chains that are able to help address uh, the challenge of climate and sustainability. So we are very pleased to have with us um, leaders that can play a very important role in the development and upscale deployment of that value chain. So the panel will be moderated by um, Mr. Ibrahim Chow, who is the executive secretary of uh, UNCCDs. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Chow. Mr. Chow, you have the floor. Thank you, Masamba. Good afternoon, everybody. We are all here because we have something in common. We care about the planet, and we know that one of the solutions is hydrogen, or maybe even green hydrogen. So let's hear about it from different panelists who are all knowledgeable about it. And you are here because either you are interested to learn or you want to share something. So we hope that the conversation will be uh, easy in that way, despite the noise around. The first speaker on my list is the Minister of Energy, Petroleum, half of the government of Mauritania, Mr. Abdeslam Ud Ahmed, who is a champion of hydrogen in Mauritania and maybe even further. I would like to hear from you what are the prospects, what are the opportunities and challenges that you see in trying to promote this new type of energy in Mauritania? We have one. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Asamba, for inviting us and convening this. And uh, thank you, my good uh, friend, brother, Brahima Chow. Brahima and I have a long, very long history. Uh, I've been talking about uh, green hydrogen for the last three years, three days. And uh, maybe people will start to be tired of hearing from, from me. And I'm happy that people start to be tired because at, Gla at, at Glasgow, one year ago, we only had one or two panels we were able to talk about green hydrogen. Nobody was willing to listen. Uh, and today, I think, with the championing that many of uh, all of us and you in this table have been doing, uh, green hydrogen is now definitely on the agenda. Uh, yes, we are championing green hydrogen in Mauritania because we are lucky to have uh, wind and solar energy uh, and space and low density of population and we can deliver basically renewable energy uh, all year long, all day long, and this is perfect to produce green hydrogen. We are doing so because also uh, when we look into the models that we have uh, commissioned an industrialization powered by green hydrogen has nothing in common with uh, industrialization, but I must say actually lack of industrialization powered by fossil fuel. Over the last three decades or four decades, the African countries, African continent have been providing the world with millions of tons of barrels of oil. But you can't mention any of the African countries that have transformed into an industrialized country over the last four decades, despite the wealth of oil. So there is something deeply wrong with the fossil fuel. It's not about only the impact the greenhouse gas emission, but it's also because it's very intensive, capital intensive industry. And therefore it creates very limited amount of employment and its linkages forward and backward are also limited. And therefore the maximum impact of these runs go through the budget and the redistribution through the budget. It can work for infrastructure. It can make good roads, good maybe uh, infrastructure, but it can't deliver industrialization. 
and this is the experience that we have been witnessing. But if we look at what uh, the green hydrogen can deliver, it's completely the opposite. Maybe we may not get a lot of money to the budget, but for sure, if we deliver the green hydrogen at scale, we will deliver industrialization. Because one of the main factors for industrialization is energy, reliability and affordability. And the green hydrogen will just deliver that. Low electricity cost, reliability for our industry, and it will kickstart completely a new set of industries. Its forward and backward linkage are just exceptional. It's very, very intensive type of industry. If we look at the models that have been done for Mauritania, the two projects that we have now, the Amman and Nur project, between themselves, they will generate an economic growth of 10%, more than 10% over a decade, and they will halve an employment rate over that same period. And this is because with green hydrogen, you can also do direct reduction and you can produce a green steel. And it so happens that Mauritania is very rich in iron ore and this possibility opens completely a new perspective for the development of the country. So this is the opportunity we, we, we see. Uh, we have all a big responsibility. Huh? We all know that we have heard this, the science has said it. Now we only have a very limited, a very short period of time, window of opportunity to bring back the world the, at the right uh, trajectory. And the green hydrogen, upscaling green hydrogen can contribute greatly to that. And all of those countries that have the possibility to contribute because of their wealth, renewable can do it. And I hope that Africa, because what is true for uh, Mauritania is also true for most of the African countries. There is just a study that, uh, as you know, we have a group of seven countries that have established the African Green uh, Hydrogen Alliance. The study that has been commissioned by the climate champions demonstrates the potential, enormous potential for the African countries. Several hubs of green hydrogen can be established and they will contribute considerably to economic growth and transforming the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for the inspiring words, but also the vision of yours and your government to promote green hydrogen in Mauritania. We will come back to Africa in a while. Please be ready, Namibia. But before that, I will go to the Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, Sir um, Danny Alexander, you have a critical role to play there, but I would like to hear from you how you will overcome this challenge of supply and um, how to call it um, uh, the, the offer and demand. It's a chicken and egg issue. Uh, there will be no large offer unless there is a demand. There will be no demand offer, large demand unless there is a, there is a supply. So how do you overcome and how do you cut that corner and make sure that we can actually move forward? You have a mic there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. And thank you, Masamba, for the invitation to join this panel. And thank you also for joining our panel this morning which was about the broader question of technology innovation to uh, tackle uh, climate change and how we can um, accelerate and bend the curve to enable that innovation to be developed and scaled more quickly. And actually, that's also, in a way, the topic of this uh, uh, the discussion. It may be the topic of almost every discussion at this COP27, in, in a way. Um, so I'm from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Before coming there, I was also a Minister of Finance in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, we are a, a, a young and, and uh, relatively new multilateral development bank formed in 2016. We have 105 members uh, around the world and we invest in infrastructure uh, with a particular focus on green investment. So we aim that uh, by 2025, at least 50% of our investment should be climate finance. And we also have a strong priority around technology 
And so it's from that perspective that we see green hydrogen as something which, as a multilateral development bank, we can uh, deploy our resources to support, uh, as you said, the different parts in, in, the, in the chain, the, 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 the renewable energy that is the input to green hydrogen, the hydrogen production, the transportation, and also um, the, 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 the end use. And I guess it's a, a little bit like the um, uh, uh, challenges you see in other sectors. How do you um, uh, achieve the, 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 the supply and the, and the, and the demand? Um, I mean, I think the first thing is to say is that one of the purposes that multilateral development banks can play in this space is to make investments to stimulate um, uh, uh, the, invest the, the, uh, the, 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 the development and the scaling of both the production and the uh, and the and the and the end use, and then I think for the end use we have to look particularly to those sectors which are um, perhaps easier to adapt as the early uh, early users. So uh, manufacturing, as the minister said, steel production, um, you know, those are areas where um, uh, 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 where green hydrogen perhaps can be incorporated much more quickly. Also transportation, and if one focuses perhaps on those sectors. Uh, that, that creates a demand to get the production going and, and allow the development of the supply chains. But it's also interesting how some countries have already, already see hydrogen as having much broader application and are starting to create the demand for themselves. I was in uh, Japan a couple of weeks ago who are promoting the idea of Japan becoming a hydrogen society um, and already working with other countries where the hydrogen could be produced and seeing how it can be shipped and so forth. So I think there's also a role for, 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 for governments at the kind of demand end of the spectrum. Obviously, the, uh, the supply is, is most effectively uh, generated in those, um, in those places that have abundant supplies of solar energy. You know, the energy that comes from the burning of hydrogen in the sun can then be converted back into hydrogen um, in, in, in those places. Um, but I think that for AIB, we see already some opportunities in... Um, in, 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 in transportation investments, for example, um, in, in green vehicles, we've invested in funds that promote green vehicles, including hydrogen-powered vehicles in China and in other parts of Asia. Um, so that, so the, 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 the demand is already s starting to develop. So maybe also substituting green hydrogen for hydrogen that's already used in the supply chain can also be um, a, a way to, uh, to stimulate this industry. But I think there is also a role for finance, and especially finance that's willing to take some of the risks at the early stage in order to support the development and the scaling of the, of the industry. And I think, again, that's where organizations like the AIB and other multilateral development banks can play a role. And so I hope very much that from this, this meeting and from, as the minister said, many discussions about green hydrogen here at COP27, we can also form the partnerships and the, and the, uh, and the relationships to uh, find the investments. Already we have some in our pipeline that we can go further with um, to, to help use our finance to help to stimulate the generation of this as a, as a key part of how the world meets its net zero goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Daniel Alexander. I'll come back to you uh, because the Asia Infrastructure Bank, Investment Bank is absolutely a big player. I remember a few years back I went to China and was received by the CEO at that time and he gave me two words as the mantra of the bank, green, and lean. So we hope that you will deliver on, on hydrogen. I say I ho we hope because um, I read an article last night which basically gave me a cold shower. I'm very enthusiastic about renewables and green hydrogen and so forth. And the report is uh, about Africa. Please be prepared, uh, both of you. The report says that in 2021, there is a reduction of 35% of investments on renewables in Africa. 35% less than 2020. Meanwhile, the world, the investments at the global level keeps growing by 9%. And 81% of the investments that were made in, energy, in, the, sector of, in the energy sector in general, 81% is renewables worldwide. So there is, there is something happening in Africa which I don't understand what it is. Because if this continent has a huge deposit of solar, wind, geothermal, uh, green hydrogen, then why people are not investing in it? So 
I would like to tease you a little bit more because I understand you are um, in the process of developing a Pan-Africa University of Green Hydrogen. Huh? Uh, Deloitte. Um, okay. Bertram Lomula. Oh, you are De Deloitte. Oh, sorry. I am addressing to the wrong, to the wrong person. I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to Deloitte. But still, you can comment on this because Deloitte is global. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe Namibia. But the question is, um, it, uh, I wanted to, to talk to you first, uh, and then I'll come back to her, and I'll go back again to, to my previous speakers. But uh, the question is, what are the challenges that the world is faced with at the moment in continents like Africa to actually invest massively on renewables? You know, the demand is high. 45% of Africans do not have access to energy, and yet investments is not forthcoming. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Secretary General, and, and also um, Musamba for having me here. It's, I'm happy to answer both questions if I can, if I may, because they are closely related. I mean, the first question is about why the investments are not going where we want them to go, and obviously there's a tendency not in the right direction. And the second one is, why is this not really taking up, particularly this year and next year? And I think you just referred to it, and some colleagues are here who know this also, we see lots of business going on at the moment. We saw your very distinguished announcement yesterday with my friend Anja Dotzenrat about Mauritania doing the things. We had the day before yesterday a big announcement by EIB, three billion loaned into the Namibia project uh, on, on hydrogen. We see it all over on the cap. We see, of course, a lot of connections between the South African transformation out of coal and what happens in Namibia. And I think there's a lot of win-win situations. With regard to the two questions, we have to start with the demand side. Because the reason why we're all discussing this here is because the demand is so big. I come from a country, Germany, and I was in government, and now I'm consulting government from outside, where we have a huge demand. We are the fourth largest economy in the world. Uh, in difference to our UK friends, we still have real economy. They were smart enough to go into the financial industry. We only have real economy, a lot of real economy. And for the real economy to trans from it to transform, we need green hydrogen. It makes a difference to be successful in the transformation or not. And the new progressive government in Germany is very much aware of it. So is, of course, the European Commission. The president of the commission has very many ideas, including a bank, to push the financial side of it. And the German government is about to come out with very uh, ambitious programs before Christmas to support these um, these um, ambitions, both of our friends in the Global South, but also of German industry and the financial community. So why are we not there? I think there are two main reasons. One is that it's really new. It's about, I'm around for 10 years in this space, and I hear this in the boardrooms of financial institutions, chemical industry, steel company, really only in the last two, three years, that they have to go there. So it's a new game. That's always with new games, you have to convince a lot of stakeholders and shareholders, you have convinced boards to do those investments. And the second thing goes back to um, my neighbor and his excellency here, referring to, of course, the huge investment opportunities that we have in the Global South. And I think many people in my country and in the EU are absolutely convinced about the win-win that we can have here in this field. But if you then go to the to the decisions, and I think the uh, special envoy from the United States, um, John Kerry pointed this out, I think I heard him 10 times, saying this in the last three days, there's so much still conventional investments, more than we have in renewables, and we have a lack of investments, particularly in African countries, with respect to the potential on the other side, and this is due to the estimated risk portfolio that bankers still see there. So what we need is smart mechanisms to hedge those risks, and I think in, in development banks can play a major role there. We need confidence on the reliability, as you just pointed out, Minister, reliability and affordability in the long run there. And we need a willingness by financial institutions, and it will not work without the private sector, to really go into this big, big, long term, and expect a reasonable return, but not the return that we knew from investments in other 
areas of, in of energy that you referred to earlier. And I think that needs time to convince. I'm expecting, and my colleague just made this comment, the numbers will look differently already next year. I'm very confident. But it will depend on the many people doing the right things in the next 24 months. Maybe this is a starting point. Vielen Dank, um, Bernhard. That's very um, uh, inspiring. I'll come back to you. Uh, please be prepared. Maggie Hino, you are the Petroleum Commissioner of Namibia. We hear a lot about Namibia on green hydrogen. It seems to be a possible transformation of the country, a possible transformation of the economy. But still, there are some challenges. So can you give us some prospects, but also the challenges that you are being faced with at the moment? Let me say what a man can do, a woman can do better. So if men could speak standing, I can do it even better. So it's, um, for Namibia, I think uh, for us it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a puchun opportunity. It's a puchun time for us as a country to be involved in this industry. And usually as a country we metamorphose very fast and we usually leapfrog two opportunities whenever they are okay. But with the, with, the, with the green hydrogen, we have taken or we have grabbed the opportunity when it came in terms of we found ourselves being located uh, geographically in a, a position that can enable us as a nation to be an energy hub. But not only that, but we are also coupled with then the abundant resources that are able to transform or to make this industry possible. I'm speaking about abundant amount of wind, abundant amount of supply of solar. And therefore, we really have all the key ingredients that uh, as a nation needed uh, in order to make the industry work. But what we find ourselves in uh, challenged is that uh, this is a new industry in terms of uh, it coming on board. First of all, even for the Namibian government, our ability to be able to create a conducive environment that can be able to attract and retain and actually make value out of this massive amount of capital that is available in the market for us to be able to transform this sector. We, we really need a lot of work still that, uh, that need to be done in terms of even the policy environment that we have for us then to be able to capture this value and be able to utilize it. Honorable Minister here has just mentioned a critical issue that uh, for us to be able to success when investments are being done in the economy, uh, we really need to have a focal or a focused approach in terms of local content so that we can be able then to create backward and forward linkages of this investment into the economies. So with these challenges, we need to ensure that the government uh, or, or African government for us to be able to succeed, we therefore need to ensure that we have created the tools that we require as nation for us then to be able to capture this value uh, not only to transform or to make a difference in terms of internal rate of return, but you would want it to leave a very big food mark and a very big footprint in your whole economy and in your whole value chain. For example, Namibia uh, throughout and, and, and other African nations within the region, uh, we have an opportunity where, for example, in terms of the key ingredients that we need for this green hydrogen industry to thrive are almost all in there. But the ability for us to be able to take this key ingredient and make a full robust industry that can be able to serve the African nation and be able to produce this molecule for the export market, we, 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 we are not, the synergies are not really there for us to be able to capture this value. I'm talking about issues like the ability for us to be able to produce rare earth mineral, we have all of them, we have all the critical elements in Namibia, we have all of them in the region, but the ability for us to be able to take those elements and be able to have a local production of, of batteries, for example, does not exist. Uh, abilities for us to be able to produce solar panels that we need for us to be able to generate the energy that we need, we don't have it in-house or in Africa. Ability for us to even just be able, the wind power planes, uh, that are needed for us to be able to produce them and assemble them in Africa, that ability is not there. But we need, the reason why this is not there is because we lack a very critical ingredient into all of this that can enable then Africa to be able to work together and build synergies that are meaningful. And this uh, critical element is therefore capacity building and knowledge transfer. 
the skills are out there in the world, but the adaptation of those skills, those critical skills, and building the capacity within the African continent is what is not there. And therefore, that's why with the green hydrogen, as uh, Namibia trying to develop himself as a green hydrogen hub, working together with Mauritania, working together with Egypt, we are then working on an approach for us to develop a Pan-Africa university that is aimed at transferring this knowledge and being able to develop it and grow it in-house on the continent for us to be able then to tap into it and be able to develop industries that can be transformational, industries that can be able to grow our economies and industries that can leave a positive footprint. And this work even in terms of us attracting the, 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 the capital that is needed. There, there is some skills that you need for you to be able to attract and retain this capital and for it to be able to make a meaningful impact. And without that skill transfer, the soft and the hard skill that we need, without them we won't be able to, that's why you are seeing that the investments, the capitals are out there, but the investment in Africa is reducing even though the global demand and the global supply of these skills is out there. But we are still working on that and therefore with this ambition and this objective of us to be able to develop these skills, we hope we can then be able to close that gap and uh, succeed in our endeavors. Thank you very much, Maggie. That's very, that was very uh, helpful. I'll give the floor back to uh, His Excellency the Minister. Um, when I hear you speaking, it, it seems like hydrogen is the next big thing, the next big revolution, and the world will change with hydrogen. Can you assure us how, what, and yet petroleum and other extractive industries have been going on for in Africa or in, the, in, in other parts in the world, of the world for many years, but they have not transformed the economies. So you, you alluded to it, you know, comparing uh, hydrogen to petroleum. But what is specific to hydrogen, in, in addition to what you said, um, green steel is certainly something uh, very important, and it will be a very important contribution to climate change because uh, steel is extremely polluting. But what would be different? Where do we go from here to 20, 30, 40, 50 in terms of hydrogen? And what is your vision? And how do you see Mauritania capturing that opportunity to actually grab an opportunity to grow with hydrogen as one of the foundations for its development? What, would be di what, is, what makes hydrogen different from petroleum or forestry or any minerals that have been ex in extraction for many years? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mentioned that uh, these are two different, I think, industries. Oil and gas uh, industries are very heavy, capital-intensive industries that just do not deliver on, uh, jobs. And you can see it in any of the oil companies, even the largest producing oil company, you can see it. Only the small countries which have huge oil reserves have been able to harness the wells, but that is that is very, very specific cases. So it's very different because, again, green hydrogen will provide cheap energy. The, what the experience of the developed countries, the countries that are today industrialized, how did they get, get there? They get there because of the energy. But they get there because of cheap energy. We should all remember that the barrel of, dollar, of uh, oil was at $2 until the mid-70s. So sheep oil has powered industrialization throughout uh, the 20th century. And this is what makes the difference. And since oil has jumped and prices have jumped, then it was no longer possible to deliver the energy at, uh, at, at, uh, at a cost that make any industry viable. And this is why all those that importing that energy were uh, were worse off, and in particular the African country. So there is a big change there, but also many of the uh, the, the 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 byproducts that will produce, or I call them byproducts between brackets, are immediately usable for the industry. You have the ammonia that can be used immediately internally. Uh, green hydrogen itself can be used immediately for transportation, for transport sector, for the mining, for others. So the ripple effects are completely different from the, this is what makes things different. 
And this is why we look at it from our Mauritania perspective as not as a solution between Greece and hydrogen alone. Won't even work if many, many other things do not change. And one of them, you need policy, dra drastic policy change you, for the governance of the sector, for the regulation, for the certification. You need to build the skills, and we don't have this, and we need to build them differently. It will not only work through universities or graduate come back. No, we need really very, very dedicated, specific uh, knowledge transfer uh, uh, plans, a uh, very innovative one to be able to be there in three or four years' time to benefit from the, the, this industry. But you need also to re de risk the capital. Uh, if someone is to l today to take loans to, uh, for a green hydrogen project, the same, the same entity in Europe, they will pay half less than if they are to do it in Mauritania. And that brings me to the strategy we are following. We are definitely trying to attract the oil companies as main partners in the green hydrogen. Why? First, because they are all, they will all be facing, everybody knows, everybody. All the studies show that gas and oil will peak around 2025. And then with the demand for renewable energy growing, there won't be space for them to continue to grow. They themselves need to transition. And they have the resources, and they have the engineering. And we should not hide that. Solving the green hydrogen, scaling it up, will require a lot of engineering. And where this engineer's house exists today, you have the oil country, of course, in other chemical com uh, companies, but oil definitely, companies, can be the one, because they have interest into diversifying their portfolio. They can bring capital got its ship because of their signature and their balance sheet, and they can, of course, mobilize highly skilled engineers to solve the problems around the engineering. This is why we gave priority to big projects uh, versus small projects. That doesn't mean that will not work will also with medium and uh, small developers, but we uh, definitely push it for that, and now with the uh, chariot we have signed for DJ Giga, and they are supported by Total Energy, and you know, they have access to the one tech of Total, which is one of the biggest uh, platform of uh, engineers in the world. And uh, we have uh, signed now with BP and we continue to push for a, a partnership with the big enterprise. Because if we are serious about climate change, we need to develop to deliver green hydrogen at scale. We need to deliver, and what the study now is saying, Africa can export as much as 80 million tons of green hydrogen by 2050. So we need to be on that path if we are really to, be a to help the planet and to help the people in this planet and, to do, and that you can only do it with very huge investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister, for that vision. And um, very clear that um, we need to manage a transition. And uh, the Paris Agreement sent a message to everybody that we need to prepare ourselves to an energy transition and to an ecological transition. And that would mean effectively ramping up clean energy and ramping down fossil fuels. The question is, what is the timeline? Danny, you heard the minister speaking about investments and there are huge sums of money that are needed to ramp up green hydrogen uh, and to ramp up clean energy in, in, in general, and um, certainly to manage also stranded assets that are found in uh, fossil fuels. From the Asian perspective, the Asian bank, and public banks have a very important role to play to leverage private financing that would be complementary to actually achieve the ambition that, that we are here. What is your, the vision of your bank in terms of providing the foundation for private investments to come to, to scale up the funding. Because we are not talking about small amounts of money here. We are seeing a huge opportunity to actually not only provide energy, but actually see how you can phase them in the current industry that is in there, the uh, power stations, the, uh, the systems that are running all with fossil fuels will need to be replaced at some point in time. That again needs some funding, please. 
So thank you very much. It's a, it's a, it's a, gr it's a great question. And um, uh, just to say, we, we are the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but we can also invest in our members in Africa and in Latin America, especially for green transitions. So um, uh, we have a number of members in Africa. We can support also clean energy development, including hydrogen, uh, also in our, in our, in our African member, uh, member countries. I think your, your question is absolutely at the heart of this, um, of the, of the, what the, what are the key questions at this COP, which is um, how can we mobilize private sector finance at the scale that is needed for these kind of investments? Now, part of it, of course, is generating the quality of the projects that are bankable, sufficiently bankable for private sector to invest in. Uh, and part of it is about um, creating facilities, lending finance together to enable the, 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 the finance to be deployed at a cost that is also um, uh, uh, reasonable. And, and the minister made the point earlier that um, you know, the, the, the interest rate differentials between different countries can be, can be very large. So we see as, as AIIB uh, a key role for our investment to catalyze and mobilize private sector finance. We aim that by 2030 at least 50% of our business will be uh, in, the, uh, in the private sector. We're building partnerships also with other organizations, for example, philanthropic organizations, sources of concessional capital, so that we can blend our finance together so that the overall financing proposition um, is, uh, uh, is, is more affordable. Um, but I think also, you know, multilateral development banks have a role to play where um, uh, the, 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 the quality of our due diligence, the fact that the, the governments are our members, which gives some also some political risk assurance, also in itself helps, helps to de-risk projects where we are, um, where we are uh, participants. Uh, in AIB, we can make equity investments as well as loans, and so um, yeah, uh, uh, making equity investments in projects or in funds that are deploying capital in this space um, also, again, can have uh, both uh, the, the, the mobilizing effect and also the confidence building uh, uh, effect. And I think we also have to develop our own uh, expertise in, in these sectors so that we can also help to identify which are the investments that are going to be most, most viable, most, um, uh, the, the best place to start, if you like, scaling up this industry. So as an example, you know, we have several hydrogen projects in our, in our pipeline already. Um, one of them is specifically related to uh, using the green hydrogen that's produced for the production of ammonia to be a feedstock into fertilizer. And it's a good example of what I was saying earlier that um, you know, in the initial phase, uh, using the green hydrogen that's produced as a feedstock for where hydrogen is already an existing component is, is, I, think, the right, is I think, the right place to start. And especially given this year we've seen huge challenges uh, as a consequence uh, of the war in Ukraine um, in, in natural gas and in fertilizer and in ammonia and so forth, actually there's a, there's a, there, there are good reasons to do with security of supply also to diversify production, to take uh, feedstocks from different sources. And so I think this is an area where uh, green hydrogen can make an immediate contribution and therefore it can also help to, to scale the supply chain and therefore also to reduce the cost. So I think multilateral development banks have a role to play in, in, in taking some of those risks to support the private sector to come in uh, at scale. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, Sir Daniel Alexander, for this. Um, Bernhard, can I, can I go back to you? Um, Deloitte is one of the largest consultancy firms, and as a consultancy firm, you have a lot of data. From your perspective, and with the data you have on your computers, can you tell us what are the innovative solutions, technologies, policies, institutional arrangements, or other financial instruments that are needed to get uh, there? to get us there. We are aiming at having a net zero by 20, latest by 2050, in most part of the world. But it requires managing better our energy sector. Of course, also our land use, but in this case, energy. So please tell us from your perspective. Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I just had an uh, exchange with His Excellency, the Minister, about the role that this war plays in the green transformation. Uh, let me make maybe three comments um, with some observations and some maybe offering some solution space at least. Um, my first observation is that we have an acceleration, not only due to the green transformations that placed 
uh, before the war, the events of the February 24, but particularly due to what happened in February 24, into what happens in Germany now with our reliability on fossil fuels from Eastern Europe into a hunger for green hydrogen and for the energy transformation. I think the time is over when we think that um, gas pen can be a long bridge into the green hydrogen future and that leads us into a, an even greater hunger and appetite in the European economy towards green hydrogen. So my first observation and something that we have to keep in mind is that there is an increasing um, demand, particularly after February 24. My second observation, and that's now more a solution, goes back, of course, um, my pre-speaker here from the Asian Development Bank, um, um, Danny Alexander, pointed out correctly that there's a huge demand to bring supply and demand together. I think the platform that a development bank, but also what we do at the moment, mainly in green hydrogen, is not only helping the demand side to better understand what it takes to become carbon neutral, but it's really about bringing the demand side with the supply side together and make sure that we, that we really unlock the private capital that we need, not only from financial industry, but also directly from demand. Because if you can buy them on a price that is your, with your directly invested, that's something that we see and observe in the offshore space in Germany at the moment, that they go directly into the space, a big engagement that BASF did with RWE, a $4 billion investment into offshore industry to produce green hydrogen. We can see similar developments and appetite and interest in doing this here in the Global South with green hydrogen. What it needs, as I said before, and you referred to it earlier, uh, Sir Alexander, is really um, leveraging both, but hedging also the risks that come upon with it. And that's something that we have to work on, which, lead, which leads me to my, to my third observation and solution to your question. It needs public sector actors to help. I don't think we will manage to unlock the capital, the financial um, needs that we have from the um, private market without, particularly in the next three to five years, public actors such as multilateral international organizations, but also banks and states to hedge risks, to bring supply and demand together, to secure access and really to make this happen because this is a challenge is so huge. The numbers we are talking about are so high that it really needs all three sides, the demand, the supply and smart platforms to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Bertram. We have a professor with us uh, who is working very hard to develop a pan-African pan university on green hydrogen. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. So Bertram Lohmuller, Lohmuller um, is uh, um, going to project some images for you. And I will come back to you, Maggie. You will be closing the session. But first, let's hear from the professor. Please, uh, can you show the first slide? It's really an honor to be here, dear excellences, dear Masambe. Uh, the point is now, and I'm really happy to declare that we are working together uh, on establishing a Pan-African Technology Transfer University. Why technology transfer? Because we have heard, we are convinced that technology is the key driver for facing the climate change and also to deal with green hydrogen and technology transfer from the Western world uh, to the Southern world is very important. Next slide, please. Um, the point is why Steinbeis is involved and where we are coming from. We are started together and with my colleagues, Thomas and Eduard, we have uh, developed a consortia and also developed a consortia with leading German and European technology leaders. And the main aim was how we can develop large-scale green hydrogen projects on the African continent. The first thing what we have learned, there are a lot of announcements, a lot of gigawatts of projects, but nobody has thought about where is the equipment coming from. Therefore, we started first to develop a consortium for equipment development. On 15th, there is an announcement together with Bosch, 
where we are presenting a new electrolyzer based on Bosch technology. We have also linked up with companies dealing with direct air capturing. Also, we have recognized there is a shortage in solar panels. Therefore, we are developing also now a large-scale production plant for solar panels on the African continent. And what we have also learned is then, and this is what also mentioned here, when you're bringing these big projects on the continent, where you get the skilled people. And therefore, the main point is how we can support these technology transfer projects. And why Steinbase is coming into uh, the game? The companies we are working together are coming from the technological point. They are saying we need experts on the ground who can work in these projects. And Steinbase University is the biggest private university in Germany. Why? Because it's 100% project integrated. Please, the next slide. What does it mean? That means all our students are working 100% in a project in companies. They are working 85% in the project. 50% is classical training. And we also do not have classical examinations. Our students have to work on so-called transfer papers. That means how the theory could be then really transformed into the real projects. And that means the company and the project has also a real benefit out of it. And it's not focused only on bachelor degrees and master degrees. We have also linked up with TÜV. We have also linked up with skilled development companies in Germany, where we're also offering short-term professional trainings for specific, specific skills on the work floor. That means this is a very important issue, how to make it really practical and to bring it on the ground. Therefore, this Pan-African Green Technology Transfer University is for us a vehicle to bring the technology to Africa. And what does it mean to bring it to Africa? The next slide, please. Yes, that means the three main hubs are Namibia, Egypt, and uh, Mauritania. There we are localizing production plants for hydrolyzing. We are localizing PV production plants. We are localizing also green hydrogen plants, especially when we're talking about it, it's one up to 20 gigawatt. And that means we are working closely together with the industry closely working together with national partners and also work together how to manage and do the technology transfer into the countries. Thank you very much. Yes, please, a round of applause to Professor. Uh, this is genius because we need practical solutions and we need uh, capacity, human capacity to run everything that we have been talking about uh, earlier. I know we are running out of time. I promise to come back to Maggie, but um, we have a, an understanding amongst ourselves that we will close the session on time. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to your Excellency Ministers. Thank you to you, Bernard. Thank you, Maggie and, um, and Danny. And thank you for your participation. <laughs>